This I have known for a long time now. The man who was born just is born for the good of his neighbors. But the man whose heart charges full speed towards personal profit is useless for his city, difficult to deal with, and good only to himself. This much I have learned not only by words, but by personal experience. Yes, personal experience. You see, out of a sense of honor and respect for family ties, instead of having an easy life sitting by an Argus, I, more than anyone else, helped Heracles while he was among us with his many labors. And now, now that Heracles has gone to live among the rest of the gods, I take care of all his children. I have taken them all under my wings and protect them, though now I too am in need of protection. Because when Heracles was taken to the heavens, Eurystheus, the king of Argus, tried to kill us all. But we ran away. We ran away and saved our lives, but not our country. We ran off in exile, always moving from one country to the next, because on top of all of the other insults that Eurystheus has delivered upon us, he has decided to cast yet one more. He has sent heralds to whatever place he hears we have settled and demanded from the ruler of that place that he surrender us to him. He would threaten that ruler by saying that Argus was too powerful a city not to make friends with, and that he, Eurystheus, was enjoying a prosperous fate. The leaders then, seeing how weak I am and how young these children are, preferred to listen to the powerful, and so they have always banished us from their land. So here I am, and here the children are, all of us sharing the same miserable fate. How could I leave them? People will then say, look at that. Now these poor children are left farther, fatherless. Ialoas, their relative, won't take care of them. So being banished from the rest of Greece, we have come here to Marathon and its precincts to sit by the altars of the gods as their suppliants, praying that they help us all. We have come here to the borders of glorious Athens because it is said that this land is ruled by the two sons of Theseus, who are related to these children. Two old people are leading this flight of ours. I, the first, frightened for the safety of these here boys. The young girls, Heracles' daughters, are cared for by Alcmene, his mother. She is in the temple there, holding them all tightly in her arms, because it would be shameful for young girls to be seen by the crowds standing by altars. Hylas and his older brothers have gone to look for another place where we can go and settle, in case we are banished from here as well. Children, the children, come, come close, quick, take a hold of my cloak. I can see your Eurystheus Herald coming. He is the man who has been pursuing us wherever we wandered in exile. Curse you! Curse you, you appalling preacher! Curse you and curse the man who has sent you here! Curse you for all the evil rumors your tongue has uttered against the brave father of these children! I suppose you feel this to be a comfortable place for you to be standing around. And I suppose you think you've come to a friendly land. You're a fool, Eolaus. A fool. Who would rather side? with a worthless weakling like you, than a powerful man like Eurystheus. Move on, old man. Get out of here. Why do you even bother? Get up and get out of here. Go to Argos, where your punishment awaits you. Stoning, I believe. No, I won't. The God's altar will protect me, and so will this land we're in, because it's free. Do you want to make more work for this hand? You will use no force upon me, nor upon these children. See for yourself. You're not much of a prophet when it comes to such matters. No, you won't. Not while I'm alive. You won't. Get away. Leave, I tell you. And these boys here, I'm taking them all to Eurystheus because, like it or not, they're his property. Men, citizens of Athens, protect us. We are here, citizens, sitting by the altar of Zeus, protector of the marketplace, as Suppliants to him, yet we are being treated most violently. Help us, men of Athens. Our garlands of supplication have been defiled, citizens. This is a disgrace to the city and an insult to the gods. Friends, 
friends. That man here, he has dishonored your odds. He wants to drag me away from the steps of Zeus's altar by force. I have come here from Mycenae. I am Iolaus. You must have heard of a man who stood by Heracles' side. I am not bereft of fame. These are the sons of Heracles, friends. They have come to you and your city as suppliants. They don't want to be dragged away from the altars by the gods and taken back for, by force by the force of Argus. They belong to Eurystheus. Send them off from this land now, and I will not lay a hand on them. It is a far better thing for someone to keep his foot outside of a place of trouble. Much better to use wisdom. Who is the ruler of this land here? Demophon, the son of noble Theseus. So, I must take this war of words with you then. Everything I've said with these has been a wasted effort. Old man, you've managed to outpace the young in getting here to the altar of Zeus. Tell us, what has brought these people here? These are the sons of Heracles. Suppliants, their wreaths of supplication, as you can see, are placed on the altar of God. I am their father, Iolaus. So why did this event call for cries of help? This man here tried to drag them away from the altar by force. That's why they cried out for help. The way he's dressed tells me he is a Greek, but his manner tells me he's a barbarian. Explain yourself and do it without wasting my time. What land are you from? Argos. I'm an Argive, if that's what you want to know. But let me tell you why I've come here and under whose orders. I've been sent here by my king, Eurystheus, the king of Mycenae, and under orders to take these children back to him. My mission is just, my friend. The deeds I must do and the things I must say are all just. I am an Argive, sir, and I am taking back Argives who have run away, trying to escape their punishment of death as sentenced by the laws of my country, Argos. All Argives have the right to fix and manage the laws of their own city and apply them upon each other. We've approached the homes of many other citizens and declared our stand to these principles to them. No one has dared to bring trouble upon himself. Still, these people had obviously come to your land either because they thought that you're a fool or, in that desperation, they took their chances with you. Surely they did not expect that if you had your wits about you, if you were not a fool, that you, unlike all the other rulers of all the many countries they've passed through, that you would sympathise with their foolish misfortunes. Choose then from these two options. Either you accept these people into your land, or you let us take them away. Now, the benefits of the second option are these. Your city will become the ally of powerful Argos and that of mighty Eurystheus. If you choose the first option, however, and let your spirits soften by their pitiful tears and begging, then the matter will need to be resolved with spears. Because don't ever think that we will let it rest without contesting it with steel. And what reason will you give for engaging in a war with us? What land, what prize will you claim you were robbed of that has caused you to go to war against Argos? Or when you're burying your fallen soldiers, which allies will you say they were defending. The condemnations from your citizens will be severe indeed if you were to let your foot step into such a quagmire for the sake of a group of children and an old man, a totally insignificant man, a man with one foot in the grave, as they say. What will you say then? The best you could say to plead your case for war would be that you can rest your hopes upon these boys, but look at them. That hope is far too short from being realistic. Even when they're fully grown up and fully armed, there'd be no match for the Argives. 
If that is where you rest your hope, then forget it, because there's also the matter of time, the time between now and when these boys will become men is long, long enough for you to be totally destroyed. No, sir, you need to give me nothing but what is my own. And you will gain mighty Mycenae as your ally. And don't fall for your usual mistake, that of choosing the weak over the powerful. Who can judge or choose the merits of a case before one hears clearly both sides of it? My Lord Demophon, what exists here in your land, but not in any other land, is the fact that just as I have listened, I am also in turn able to speak without being sent away before I have finished saying what I have to say. This man, my lord, he and us, we have nothing in common. The laws of his city have banished us. We are exiled from Mycenae, from our native land, banished from it. So how could he justly call us Mycenaeans and then take us away back to that land? So far as they are concerned, we are now foreigners? Or do you think that banishing someone from Mycenae means that they are also banished from the rest of Greece? Well, not from Athens. And the Athenians will not send the children of Heracles away from their land because they are afraid of the Argives. No, this is not Patrakis, nor some town in Achaea from which you were dragged away these children, even though they were suppliants seeking refuge at the altar of the gods. And you didn't achieve that by pleading a just cause, but by bragging about Argus, just like you're doing now. If this happens here too, and they fall for your words, well, then I will not be able to think of Athens as a free country anymore. No, they won't do it because I know the mind and nature of these people very well. They would rather die because men of virtue would ra much rather die than feel shame. But enough about praise of the city. <laughs> too much praise can bore people. I know because I personally have felt bored when people have praised me too much. But to you, the ruler of this land, it is your duty to save these children. You, you see, your father is Theseus, who was the son of Aethra, who was the daughter of Pythias, who in turn was the son of Pelops. As for these children, uh, let me tell you their lineage. Heracles was the son of the god Zeus and Alcmene, who was Pelops' daughter. And so you see, your father and their father are the sons of first cousins. Therefore, Demophon, you are related to these children. But beyond this tie of blood, let me tell you what your obligations are towards them. Let me tell you, Demophon that as your father's shield bearer, I once crossed the oceans with Theseus to go and fetch that most murderous girdle that belonged to the queen of the Amazons, Hippolyta. After that, Heracles went on to rescue your father from the dark dungeons of Hades. The whole of Greece could attest to that event. And it is by way of recompense for that event that these children now ask from you this one single thing, which is that you don't hand them over to their enemy. Don't let the enemy use this force against them and drag them away from the altars of your gods and away from your land. I, I, I beg you, Demophon, I, I wrap my hands around your knees and touch your beard in supplication. These children of Heracles have fallen into your care. And do not betray that care and be their true relative, be their friend, uh, their father, their brother, their master. All things are preferable than to be handed over to the archives. Eolaus, there are three thoughts that force me not to reject your words. The first and most important thought is Zeus, at whose altar you and this group of children stand as suppliants. The second is the fact that I am related to them, and so I am obliged to make sure that for their father's sake, they should be treated well by us. Finally, it is the fear of shame, a fear that concerns me more than everything else. 
Because if I were to allow the violent pollution of this altar by a foreigner, people will think that I no longer rule a land that is free and that I have betrayed its suppliants because I was afraid of the Argives. That would be a crime almost serious enough for me to hang myself. Of course, I would have much preferred it if a much happier circumstance had brought you here, but nevertheless, have no fear that you and these children will be forcefully removed by anyone from this altar. Now you go to Argos and tell your king, Eurystheus, what's happened here. Tell him also that if he has a lawful charge against these people, then he'll be treated lawfully. But you will not be dragging these children away from here. But what if my cause were just and my words victorious? What justice is there in abducting suppliants? It is easy for you to say. No harm will come to you, but I will be disgraced. No, I would be disgraced were I to let you drag these children away. Well, then just take them outside the borders of your city and we'll take them away from there. Only fools think they can outwit the gods. It seems to me that this is a place where criminals can find refuge. The precincts of the gods are common refuge for everyone. This might not be the view of the Mycenaeans. No, the Mycenaeans are not in charge here. I am. Only if you behave wisely and don't offend them. Be offended all you want. I shall not sin against the gods. No. I'd rather you don't go to war against Argos. Well, so would I, but I am not going to let these children be taken away. Just the same, since they are mine, I will take them. Well, in that case, you shall find your path back to Argos to be very difficult. Well, we'll soon see about that. Well, no, the moment you touch these children will be the moment you will groan with pain. All right. I will leave. A single man is weak in a fight. But I shall return with a big fully armed force of Argive soldiers. There are thousands of fully armed men with Eurystheus as their general waiting for my report about this. They're just outside the southern borders of your city at Megara. The moment Eurystheus hears of your insolence, he will pounce with rage upon you and upon your city, your people and your crops. This is precisely why we have such a large army of young men to punish people like you. Go hang yourself, you vulgar creature. I'm not afraid of you or your Argos. I am not going to let you abduct this city's suppliants and in the process put me to shame. This is Athens, a city that is free, a city that is ruled by me, not by your Argos. Hi, welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, and I'm here with the Center for Hellenic Studies, the Cosmos Society, and Out of Chaos Theater to bring to you uh, Euripides' Children of Heracles, or the Heracleidae. Um, we've visited this play before, way back in November of 2020, um, but we come here again um, to a, a almost always timely play, and our special guest for the day, Catherine Liu Su. Um, so, Catherine, I know you've done a lot of work on this play, um, and I think you're going to help us understand it even more today. Um, but one of the things I noted from the beginning um, is how much time Euripides spends setting up the myth and the players. Uh, because, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about myth, but I keep having to remind myself who all these people are. Um, so, so what's the basic myth going on and what's the setup that we need to understand to get some of the themes? Yeah, so what we're seeing here really is kind of this generational transition after Heracles has died. We see um, the after effects of this long time enmity between Heracles and his cousin Eurystheus. And Eurystheus is the king of Argos who, was right, who had taken over uh, Heracles' rightful place. And he's the person who sent Heracles out on all of these famous labors that we love to tell the stories of. And the whole point of Eurystheus is that he's an, an inferior man. He is not as strong, he's not as brave, he's not nearly the great hero that Heracles is. And the great injustice of Heracles' life is that he is subservient to him. And this continues even after Heracles' death, um, 
where uh, Eurystheus is very nervous <laughs> to have this lifelong enmity with Heracles that Heracles' sons are going to grow up to avenge their father. And so he persecutes Heracles' children, who at the time, at least the group that we see on the stage, are these young, kind of helpless, sympathetic children who have no protector. Without their father, they have no protection. And so the children of Heracles have been going from city to city, having been uh, expelled from Argos and Mycenae, and they're looking for refuge. And no one will accept them because the Herald, Caprios, as, as we've met him, this horrible, arrogant uh, Herald goes about and says, hey, you don't want to make an enemy of Argos. Don't mess with us. We're powerful. You want to make us your friend. And it's only at Athens, famously, that they find a city that's willing to stand up to this terrible bully. So we've seen this theme before in Greek tragedy, where, you know, Athens is the place that fixes other people's wrongs, right? Theseus does this um, in another, another point. Um, but where's the son Demophon come from, right? He's someone who's like, I, every time I read this play, I'm like, wait a minute, where did this guy come from? So, so is this someone Euripides invented for this play? Um, does he have sort of a cult or myth ex existence apart from it? What can you tell me? And sorry, I didn't give you that question ahead of time, uh, but this is one that always gets to me. Yeah, so I, I don't think that Demophon is invented entirely by, by Euripides, but it's true that he's a kind of shadowy figure whom we can do whatever we want with for the purpose of the play. And he has this brother, Akamats, who like apparently shows up and never even says anything. Um, and it, it's very interesting that this play, of course, is performed at Athens and it's about an Athenian myth. And in, in terms of the historical context, um, this play we think was performed somewhere around 430, maybe a few years after that, um, at the start of what we know to be the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. Um, and so we've got this story, this myth about Athens that was very popular at Athens. They talked about it a lot. Um, Aeschylus had a Heraclitae that we don't have uh, surviving for us, but it showed that this is a recurring theme in the funeral orations or in the, in the ways that Athens talked about itself to itself. Look at us, we are the generous city. We are the city that stands up for the helpless. And yet this play, I think, really challenges the myth. It uses the myth to reflect back moments when maybe Athens is not actually living up to its ideals. And we'll see that at the end of the play. So can you tell us a little more about why this play um, works or doesn't work at its time? So it's 4.30 or a little later. Um, and this play, you know, just for people, um, you know, listening along, um, sets these opponents in the Peloponnese, right? Argos, who aren't, who isn't necessarily friendly with Sparta, Mycenae, which may or may not be a stand-in for Sparta, and Athens sort of standing against them. So it's easy to see sort of, you know, proxies for the ongoing conflicts. Um, but my suspicion is because it's Euripides, it's more complicated than that. Um, so can, can you sort of like tease out some of these potential associations for me? Yeah, well, I think an important association to remember is that the children of Heracles very famously go on to rule the Peloponnese. Mm. And so when the Spartans come and invade Attica, they are doing so as the, as the descendants of Heracles. Um, and so when Athens says, hey, we're, we will protect you. And then there's all these figures in the place saying, Athens, a wonderful city. You will always be our friends. We will always be grateful to you. It's a way of, I think, highlighting the political situation that they're in where these um, Spartans who should be grateful to Athens and in Athens is always reminding everyone else in Greece, you should be grateful to us like what we did uh, in the Persian War. Um, it's kind of feeding into that kind of rhetoric. Okay. Um, and, and the beginning really sets up something that I think would have been clear to ancient audiences, but less clear to us, which is it has a semi-forensic structure, right? We have, you know, it's sort of, a, and what we call an agone, right? A, a competition. Um, so can, like, how would this debate between Caprius um, and Yolaus, uh, mediated by Demophon, have struck ancient audiences? So I think we are, I think it's a wonderful debate and um, 
one of the things that's very interesting is Copperhead, he's made out to be the villain, right? right? He has all of these self-serving arguments that actually will end up turning out to be kind of true later. Um, but in the beginning, he, he's set up as a total villain. He's, a, he's like trying to beat up an old man. I mean, he's trying to drag a suppliant away from the altar, which is an absolute no-no. Mm -hmm. um, and then when he talks about uh, why uh, Demophon should give up these supplements, he uses these self-interest arguments. Like, why would, you, why would you lead your city into battle against Argos for these people who are not your allies? They're not bringing you any real benefit. Um, you think maybe these sons of Heracles will grow up to defend your city, but like, look at them. They're like five years old. You know, we're like at least 15 years away from them being useful. Um, it's all about this kind of self-interest. Um, you can make an alliance with us. We'll be your friends. And like, we're, we're going to be good friends to you. And these clearly were persuasive arguments with other cities. Um, Eolus's arguments back are on a different plane. He doesn't say like, we can really help you because it's not true. We're looking at two old people and a bunch of children. We're, we're missing that inner generation of like 24 year old young men who can lead in battle. That would be Hillis who actually is um, described later but he doesn't show up on stage. And he talks about values. He talks, he invokes, um, Zeus at whose altar they're sitting. And then he talks about family connections and about reciprocal favors. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, Heracles, these children's father, he helped your father, Theseus, when Theseus was improbably <laughs> stuck on a magical stone in the underworld when he was trying to kidnap Persephone. Uh, Heracles famously went down and rescued him and brought him back to life such that he was able to then father uh, Demophon and Achamas. Um, so he's really talking about something else where he mm -hmm. talks about freedom. What does it mean to be a city who is not pushed around? It's not going to be bullied by someone else. We have this, the ability to make our own choices. I think those are the kinds of arguments that are appealing to Demophon in that moment. Demophon wants to be the kind of king who can say, yes, you know, because of Zeus, uh, because of family, and because I don't want to feel ashamed, because I want to feel like I'm free. These are the reasons why I will accept um, these suppliants. But then we'll see in the next scene, um, he immediately revokes the decision. Immediately. All of these things about values, they kind of go poof. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Euripides is really pushing his audience and, and we are his audience today to consider um, this push and pull between ethical values that we'd like to say that we adhere to and concrete realities. And I think so. the way you put it now, and you probably hear this all the time, um, makes me think of the Melian dialogue in Thucydides' Pelopon um, Peloponnesian War, right? That that conflict between sort of abstract aspirations and then the expedience of power. Um, and Euripides, like we know, he's pretty smart, right? Um, and it makes it pretty motivating here, um, but it's so stark. And I think part of what makes this play like depressing is uh, Demophon's uh, vacillation and movement. Um, but then it also for me, it's trying to get in the mind of the people watching it. Um, so getting in their minds, I think we could talk about the, the modern residents after the break. Um, how do you think ancient audiences responded to this first part? Um, and what are you looking for in the next scene um, to sort of like move these themes along? Well, it's always challenging to get into the head of the ancient audience. I know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a little unfair. <laughs> our, our limited understanding. Um, but I would imagine that this first part of the play might feel pretty comfortable. Um, that we're kind of, we're giving these, giving these figures who are obviously good and obviously bad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're watching the, the good win. And so like, that's pretty good. Of course they know like this is just the first 400 lines of the play <laughs> yeah. and there's a lot more to go. It, it obviously it doesn't end here. Um, but something that I, I think is very interesting about the opening of the play, um, it opens with these lines. This I've known for a long time now, the man who is born just is born for the good of his neighbors, right? Communal benefit. But the man whose heart charges full speed towards personal profit or what I might think of as self-interest is useless for his city, difficult to deal with, and good only to himself. 
And so when you come into this play called The Children of Heracles about Athens' great moment being far superior to every other place in Greece ever, <laughs> and then we get this question about what is communal benefit versus self-interest, we're already framing this tension. Yeah. Um, and so maybe, I don't know, these first lines, I tend to skip over them because I think of this as this kind of banal sentiment, you know, count no man lucky until he's dead, you know, you, <laughs> I tend to skip over. Yeah. But actually, it is this programmatic statement for analyzing each character and the decisions of the city, um, which we see through Demophon. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, an audience that was more alert that to, than I was um, to these first lines might sense that tension, too. And I think it's a, it's a powerful invitation to consider whether or not the ethics we hold true for the individual expand to the state. Right. And so then populate through the way states engage with each other. Um, yeah. which is, you know, uh, the, that conflict between the individual and the state is sort of central to the play. Uh, so looking to the next scene, um, what would you tell modern audience members are some notes to listen for? Yeah, well, so we, we are skipping ahead to the next scene. So something that we're skipping over is Demophon coming out and talking to Aeolus and this young man who just gave us this really rousing decision um, on, on an ethical basis comes out and he's sad in his face, maybe they've changed the mask or something, or he could just show it in the way that he walked. And he always says, oh, you know, what's wrong? And he says, oh, I have a problem. I, I have a problem uh, because the oracles are all saying that we will not be triumphant in battle unless a virgin of noble birth is human sacrificed to Persephone. Um, which is this like wild Greek kind of myth, which is you know not unique in Greek myth, um, but it's like pretty out there. Yeah. Um, and he says, "Look, actually, I know I said like Athens stands up for the good and we're a free city, but this comes from the gods, like you know. And I will not sacrifice one of my daughters. I will not compel a citizen to sacrifice his daughter. What kind of father would do that? Of course, in Greek myth, we know what kind of father would do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um." But he, he immediately said, and, and now there's statutes in the city. There's still, there's, I'm, I'm dealing with civil war. Some people are saying that I was wrong to accept these supplements. And some people say that we did the right thing by the gods. And this is exactly what Coprius, he predicted. He said, if you accept these people and go to war, like your citizens are not gonna be happy with you. And so we see this, this villainous argument that was defeated in the first scene actually turns out to be right. And so there's already this kind of topsy-turvy feel to the play, which I think can be very startling um, and, and disrupts our expectations. Uh, so I would, I would tell our audience to look for um, how, how this is handled um, and then what are our expectations, how is the problem going to be solved? And, you know, spoiler, Daughter of Heracles is going to come out and, and volunteer. And what does that tell us about the obligations of refugees to the city that accepts them. Thank you for that frame, uh, Catherine. All right, so we'll move to this next scene. We've skipped a scene as Catherine let us know. Um, and so we're gonna start uh, with one of the daughters of Heracles. Dear strangers, please do not consider my coming out here as an act of impudence. Let that be my first request. I am well aware that for a woman, it is best that she is silent, modest, and remains quietly within her house. But then, I allow, I have heard your anxious words. And though I was not given the charge by my family to do so, I nevertheless feel that I am fit to do this. And since I am very concerned about my brothers and about my own self, I have come out to ask you, I allow, if there is some new misfortune on top of all the others that has come to trouble your mind? Dear girl, I have always thought of you as one of the best children that Heracles ever had, and justly so, it seems. Child, we thought that we were on the right track up until now, but we find that once more we are heading in the wrong direction, with no prospects of escape, because the chanters tell us that, according to the oracles, if we and the city are to survive this, then it's not a bull or a calf that we must sacrifice to Demeter's daughter, but the daughter of a noble. And that's where we are stuck now. 
The king here says that he will neither sacrifice his own daughter nor force any of his citizens to do so. As well, he also told me in subtle but clear words that since he wants to save Athens, we must find some other way out of this difficulty or else leave here and find some other land to go to. So it is this prophecy that stops us from being saved? Yes, my child, just this prophecy. In all other matters, we are fortunate. And I allow here the enemy spear of the archives no longer. I am ready, old sir, ready and willing to volunteer to be sacrificed, to die for this cause. <laughs> what, what reason could we possibly give for trying to save our lives instead of saving a city that has accepted our call for help and has suffered such pain and danger on our behalf no no we can't do that we would be ridiculed by people if we sit by the altars of the gods as suppliants and wail like cowards when we are in fact the children of such a great man <laughs> what honorable man would see this as proper no if far rather the city fell though may the gods forbid it and i fell to the enemy with it then i the daughter of a splendid man have to suffer dishonor and then die just the same. <laughs> but then how could I cope with the fate of a wandering exile? Would I not feel shame when people ask me, do you love your life so much that you have come here to our land bearing the vows of a suppliant? Leave this land, we give no aid to cowards. As well, I know that many have betrayed their loved ones before me, but not even if my brothers here had died and I had survived. Not even then could I ever hope to live a happy life because who would want to marry a single woman like me? One who has no family and to have children with me? Well then, is it not better for me to die than to endure the terrors of a fate I do not deserve? No, that, that fate is more appropriate for someone who is not born from a family as noble as mine. Come now, take me to where this body must be slain. Place the garlands on me, and if this is your wish, begin the rites of sacrifice. Defeat the enemy. I give my life of my own accord and under no one's compulsion, and I am willing to die not only for the sake of my brothers, but also for my own sake, because I have discovered this splendid thing that by not loving my life so much, I can die a most glorious death. Oh, my child, you are truly of the seed of divine Heracles. You are truly no one else's daughter but that brave hero's. Your words, dear girl, make me feel proud, but also I feel sad about your fate. Let us do this more justly, Macharia. Uh, let us bring out here all of your sisters and let us decide this by lot. Let her who draws the lot die for the family. It's not right for you to die without having drawn lots. No, old man, do not even consider such a thing. I will not die by drawing lots. What value does such a death have? I will not die by compulsion, but if you approve of me and if you wish to make use of my willingness to die for my brothers, then I will do so. Oh, my child. A speech even more noble than the last. A noble speech itself. Your new deeds and words become more noble than your last. I won't force you nor forbid you to die. Macaria. But by dying, do your brothers good. Wise words, old man. Come with me, old man, because I want to die by your own hands. Though you must not fear that my blood will cause you religious pollution. I am dying of my own free will. And when I am dead, cover my body with my garments. If I am truly the daughter of the man I am boasting to be, then I fear not the terror of this sacrifice. No, my child, I, I can't. I, I do not have the strength to stand there and watch you die. Well then, ask this man if I may be allowed to breathe my last in the hands of women instead of men. 
Your wishes, poor girl, will be granted. It would indeed be shameful of me not to grant you your rightful funeral wishes for many reasons. You are a very brave young woman, and it is also just and proper that I grant it. You are indeed the bravest woman I have ever seen, the bravest of them all. Well then, if you wish, say your words of farewell to your brothers here and to this old man before you go. Farewell, old friend. Farewell and uh, teach these boys how to be just like you. Wise in all things, just like you. That would make them adequately wise. Try your best to save them from death. We are all your children raised by your own hands. And you can see that I myself am sacrificing my own wedding day for them. And you, my brothers who are gathered here all around me, I hope you find happiness in life and gain all the things that my heart will not. Respect and honor this old friend and the woman, the old woman inside the temple. Alkmeni, my grandmother, as well as these people here who are your hosts. And if you are ever free of all your troubles and the gods let you return home, think of the woman who has saved your lives and consider what burial rights you owe her. Surely they should be the best possible because I did not neglect my family in its hour of need, but gave my life for it. And if there is anything beneath the earth, then I go there with these thoughts as my dowry and not as a mother or as a woman who gave her virginity. But I hope there's nothing there because if we mortals must deal with cares even after we die, then where can we go to be free of them? Do not people consider death to be the cure of all care? So Sophocles has a line somewhere that says death is the final doctor for all disease. And I find, you know, I think Tabitha does an amazing job there just reading, sort of breathing life into this final speech from, uh, from Macaria. Um, but Catherine, you and I were talking a little bit about this. So Euripides is, I, I wouldn't say quite obsessed, but maybe low-key obsessed with, with self-sacrifice, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, in the Phoenicia, in the Phoenician women, Menoikius takes, uh, takes his own life to save the city. Iphigenia eventually gives in to sacrifice for the Trojan War. And there's a list, right? Like a half dozen even more of people who like give their own lives for their city or their family. Um, but this character seems a little different. So we're asking before about, about Demophon and his sort of presence in myth apart from this. Um, where does this sort of daughter of Heracles stand in myth for you? And what do you think of her presence in this play? Yeah, so this, this daughter who in, in the actual Greek text doesn't even have a name. Um, we don't have any, th th I, I think this is entirely invented for this play. Um, or at least I haven't seen any evidence um, of, of this anecdote anywhere else. Um, and it's a very strange, the way that the play handles her is so strange um, because usually when you mention these other plays that Euripides writes where he has to sacrifice, it is actually the center point of the play, this decision and then the ramifications of it. It's so important. If it's Janaya, everything comes from her self-sacrifice. Um, Agamemnon's death, you know, they're singing choral odes about it. Um, and yet in this play, <laughs> Macaria, she, she makes this grand decision. She walks off the stage. There's a little bit, Aeolus is sad and there's a little choral round off about it. And then she's never mentioned again. Uh, when the battle goes well, no one says, oh, you know, we can thank Macaria for this. Or at the very end, when um, Eurystheus is defeated and Alcmene is, de is demanding his death, she doesn't say, you know, my granddaughter died, and so therefore you must die. She, she, she just goes poof. Um, and so there's a strange, there's a strangeness mm -hmm. to this episode and, and to the figure herself who doesn't get a lot of interiority to work with. She doesn't hesitate. She says all the like right things that a good suppliant woman would say. Mm -hmm. um, 
virtue is most important. I, I must show my, my good birth from a courageous father by showing courage here. Um, how could we ask the city to do something for us if we're not willing to do stuff for the city? Um, and so she's saying, you know, these the army is going out to fight for us. So I have to be willing to die as well. Um, there's no hesitation. She doesn't even really mourn over the loss of her family, a potential future family life, which we certainly see uh, if it's not do. Um, and so I, I find her very strange and, um, there's something a little bit, she's almost so perfect. It's a little alienating. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder whether, you know, my approach to the play is to see these different characters as they come out on stage and they each kind of have a narrative episode as representing different types of refugees, kind of holding them up to the light and saying, Hey, like, what does this person bring to the city? why should we accept this person or why should we reject this person? And she's this idealized figure. That's partly why she's like so cardboard cut up. She's that ideal. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that makes her so valuable to the city is that she doesn't expect to live there. Yeah. She gives her life for the city. She doesn't expect to marry an Athenian. Um, she, this, this non-citizen woman, this foreign woman who might come and expect to marry an aristocratic man um, she doesn't ask that of the city. She's not going to give birth to children who, um, in the historical context, would have been considered non-citizen children because she she would have been a medic woman. Um, and so she just she's just that nice ideal. And then we can kind of set her aside, um, which is enraging because of course she just gave up her life. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that's one of the tensions that this play is, is dealing with. You know, what what do we do with refugees? Maybe we just kind of ask them to like be ideal and then not be seen. Right, because she gets to exist briefly as a prop, right? Both literally in the play and as a political tool. Um, when we've mm -hmm. talked about this play before, we've talked about how, you know, women and children are often seen as the ideal refugees because they don't represent sort of threat, right? That men do. Uh, but in the Athenian context, there's, uh, it's a little different, as you just said, because of the status of children of foreign born women in Athens, um, in, in introducing them into the, women, into the city creates problems as well when it comes to inheritance um, and citizenship status. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, again, this always unfair question, um, do you think the audience saw her and like felt for her because she hits all those notes or, or does the sort of cardboard cutoutness, the superficiality of, of her character shine through even in the Greek. I, so I think that as a reader, I find this play very strange and full of hiccups and discontinuities. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Athenian audience was not as Aristotelian as we are today mm -hmm. in our expectations of tragedy. Mm -hmm. So but they couldn't have known um, when Macaria leaves the stage that she, <laughs> no one was going to say anything about her ever again. Oh, yeah. um, I think they very well may have expected this to come back. And maybe when they left, maybe when they left the theater, they would have said like, huh, whatever. Remember, <laughs> remember that girl who <laughs> came out and said she was going to die and then we never talked about her again? Huh. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was some wondering about it, but maybe not. I mean... I, I think this is a difference with um, modern versus ancient audiences. I think tragedy is much wilder than we like to give it credit yeah, for. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. And, you know, there's, we have time to stop and talk about her, but we have to remember there are choruses, there's music, there's spectacle, and they move on to the next one. And I think most of the examples I just mentioned of other self-sacrifice are probably later than this play. Right. So I'm looking at this play and this character and thinking about a more, uh, for lack of better terms, a more developed motif. Right. In the Euripidean um, uh, corpora. Uh, instead, we're looking at this is sort of this beginning. And yeah, the strangeness is hard for me to sort of uh, get over. Um, so, you know, when you're when you're thinking about this play and writing about it, um, do, you, do you usually present um, Macaria as this sort of like idealized yet sort of flat character? Yeah, I do because, you know, I, I, I love this performance that we just watched, which really brought out, I think, that hesitation, you know, when she comes out and she says, oh, you know, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. And then, and then her resolve 
And then her farewell, I, I think actually seeing it performed um, means that maybe I need to give this character a little bit more credit than, mm -hmm. than I necessarily would have gotten away from just reading her on the page where I just see trope after trope yeah. <laughs> coming out right. um, that, that we recognize as fitting into like, okay, this is a good woman. Um, but, you know, maybe I do need to give this character a little bit more credit. Well, and one of the things that happens in these performances, though, is like modern actors approach the roles, I think, with a depth of um, empathy uh, that we can't necessarily assume ancient actors would have. Right. Um, because I think and Tabitha like, is a re repeat offender here and breathing life and beauty into characters who are so flat on the page. We, but we can ask her about that, about that later. Um, so, you know, um, Jumping into the next scene, we're, again, we're going to skip a little more. Um, what what are we going to miss before we get to the next scene? Um, and then what sort of themes do you see activated um, along the way? Yeah, so the, the next scene that we are skipping over really centers around Aeolus and what mm -hmm. he brings to the city um, or what he doesn't bring to the city. So he's presented rather strangely in this play as a very old man who's basically the same age as his own grandmother, Alcmini. Um, he was actually a generation younger. He's a nephew of Heracles. So he's been given advanced age. Um, I think because again, he can't be too useful. If he were in the, his prime of life, um, he doesn't really fit in so well to the concerns of the play. Um, and so we get this strange kind of comic scene where he wants to go off to battle, the sacrifice of Makaria is in the rear view mirror, driving right along, going to battle. And he's being offered these, it's like 80 pounds worth of metal armor to carry to battle. And, and he can't do it. No. He can't do it. He's like tottering along. And um, we think of this as comic because any time that you like talk about the body being weak, that's like activates ideas of what would have been funny on a Greek ancient Greek stage. Um, he's like, you know, trying to kiss his biceps like that <laughs> to shame. And, uh, and he goes off to battle and then the messenger, a messenger comes back and reports on the battle to Alcmene, um, Heracles' mother, the grandmother of the children of Heracles. And the messenger describes this really unlikely miracle mm. that happens to Eagles. He's someone who cannot fight on behalf of the city. He cannot help except when he is chasing Eurystheus, the tide of battle has um, already turned, the Athenians are winning, he jumps on, on Hillis' chariot, he's driving the chariot, uh, which requires a lot of strength, and he prays to Hebe, the goddess of youth, and this cloud descends on the chariot in the description of the messenger, and two stars are shining, which supposedly represent Heracles and Hebe, and he is rejuvenated, uh, presumably temporarily, just long enough um, for him to capture this hated enemy, Eurystheus. Um, and so, you know, there was this terrible tension with the needing a daughter sacri to sacrifice herself. And now it seems like the good guys win. Um, before, right before this happened, I do want to mention this. Um, Hillis, the grown son of Heracles, had challenged Eurystheus to single combat. And Eurystheus, being the coward, refused and instead mm. sent his army into to battle. Um, so we're set up to believe that Eurystheus is gonna be this coward um, as the mythological tradition has always shown us as we see in this messenger speech and then we will be surprised when we meet him in, on stage. So before we move to the stage though, how does Alcmena get here? Right, she's not like, why is she hanging out near Athens? Like, is there any mythical background for her getting there or is this just sort of Euripidean uh, convenience? Well, I think that, um, well, he needs Alcmina for the final scene. Okay. <laughs> um, and I think she represents this refugee who refuses to assimilate, who refuses to take on the laws of the land that she comes to. Mm. Um, and I think there is something about these refugee, refugees being old and young. Um, and so her job within the world of the play is to take care of the daughters of Heracles within the temple. And so there's this like kind of gendered distinction and space on the stage. Um, but she is someone who has really suffered a great deal as the mother of Heracles. And she's had these years and years of trauma and hatred towards this one person. 
Um, and so I think she allows Heracles, uh, Euripides to really deal with that burden. Okay. Um, so turning then to the, to the final scene, um, we're going to look at sort of the characterization of, of Eurystheus, the characterization of uh, Alcmene, um, and the resolution, resolution of the play. Um, so we'll see you after. You hateful creature, you. So you have come, have you? Has justice finally caught up with you? Look at me. Turn your head this way and have the courage to face me. Turn and face your enemy. You are not the master now, but the servant. Tell me, you miserable creature, tell me because I really wanna know. Are you the man who dared to heap so many insults upon my son? I don't know where Heracles is right now, but was it you who sent him off alive to the dark halls of Hades and to kill Hydras and lions? Are you the beast who had made him perform all sorts of other insulting labors, too many of them for me to mention now? Was there any other insult you dared throw at him? But all that was not enough for you, but your arrogance has driven me and these children sitting here as suppliants to the gods from every corner of Greece, elderly and babies alike. But here you are. Now you've come across men and a free city who are not afraid of you. Now you must die a miserable death, but even that will be too good for you because after all the dreadful deeds you have performed, you ought not to die only a single death. What law protects him from being put to death? This man ought not to live. He ought not to see the light of another day. I am one who can kill him. I cannot deny it, I love this city, but this man here, this man has been delivered into my hands and there's no one who will take him away from me. Let them call me reckless or overly proud for a woman, but I will nevertheless accomplish this one deed. I shall kill him. Woman, understand this well. I will neither try and flatter you nor say any words about my life from which people will draw the conclusion that I am a coward. This hateful affair was not of my own making or will. I know well I am your cousin and a relative of your son, Heracles. Hera sent me this illness and like it or not, I had to go through with it. This was the work of a goddess. And so I took up this battle, and from the moment I did, I began to contrive all sorts of terrible deeds against him. I stayed up nights, thinking of ways of killing my enemy, of sending him off so that I would not have to spend the rest of my life pursued by fear. I knew well, woman, that your son was not merely a hollow name, but a true man. An enemy, yes, but a famous one, one with an honourable name, a noble man, and when he died, since his children had inherited his hatred towards me. What was I supposed to do? Should I not try my best? Should I not leave no stone unturned to try and kill them or banish them so as to keep myself and my affairs safe from them? If you were in my place, if you had such a lion for an enemy, would you let its cubs run round free? Would you not pursue them frantically till the end? Would you be wise letting them live in Argos? No one would believe that. Well, now that they have not killed me, back there on the battlefield where I was eager to die, the person who will kill me will be polluted. The city, being far wiser than you, has a greater regard for the god than it has for the hatred towards me and has let me live. What if I were to kill him and obey the city's wishes at the same time? Simply by killing him and then handing his body over to those of his family who want to come and claim it. 
That way, so far as his body is concerned, I will be doing as the city wishes and his death will satisfy my own need for justice. Do so. Kill me. I'm not going to beg you for my life, but since this city has refused to kill me, I will grant it this ancient oracle of Phoebus Apollo. When I die, you must bury me where my fate has declared, in front of the shrine of the virgin goddess Pallas Athena. Then I will be a friend and protector to both the city and to you, its citizens. I will protect you from the hostile descendants of these children, the children of Heracles, who in the future will come here with a great army against you, traitors to the kindness you have shown them today. That's the sort of guests you are defending here. Knowing all this, then, you may ask how it is that I was not afraid of the gods' words and have come here. The answer is that I thought Hera was far greater than any oracle and she would not betray me. Now, do not let them pour any libations or the blood of sacrificed victims onto my tomb and I shall give them a horrible journey back to their home. And that will benefit you citizens doubly because with my death, I shall harm them and save you. Why wait, men? You have heard what he said, kill him. It will save my children as well as the city. He is showing us the safest course. He is our enemy now, and his death will be our gain. Go on, take him away. Kill him. Kill him and then throw him to the dogs. So... I'm not sure if there's a more chilling and ending to a play than just sort of shouting for someone to kill. And I'm wondering where we're supposed to be rooting. Um, so Catherine, one of the things you reminded me of when we were talking um, is that part of the staging of this play is that the chorus has been taken out. Taken out. Um, so can you sort of like sketch out for us what the chorus does in the play and how having it absent changes the ending? Yeah, so this was, um, I think, a very interesting decision that was made to take the chorus out of the play um, with the idea that we as the audience are really truly standing in for the chorus. And um, in this section of the play, the chorus is explaining to Alcmina, you know, um, Aeolus has captured Eurystheus. He has sent Eurystheus to you so that you can enjoy your triumph over him and you can, you can vaunt over him. Um, and then Alcmina enjoys that and she says, okay, now we're going to punish him and give him what he was going to give us. We're going to kill him. And the court says, oh no, actually, um, excuse us. <laughs> uh, there is a rule here. There's a law um, that once an enemy has been spared on the battlefield, you can't kill him. That would be a war crime. And she says like, what? <laughs> I don't know this law. Um, this, is, this isn't right. How could this be just to spare this enemy who has done this to me and my family? And they're like, well, the law is the law. And, um, you know, Hillis, this young man who's actually useful to the city, he, he, was, he was listening to our namas, our custom, our law. Um, and so we have this tussle over, over the values of the city, which have, have already been debated over and over throughout the play. And, and now we've kind of got a new test case to think about, you know, what does assimilation look like? You bring people who threaten violence into your city. And what if they don't wanna give up their customs, uh, Alcmini's customs and expectations? Um, and so, so there's another turn and another change in tone in this section of the play where Eurystheus comes out and I know I would have expected him to come out looking very cowardly, uh, sniveling, groveling, um, telling lies, being uh, particularly rhetorical about himself. And instead he comes out and, and I think he sounds, I, I don't know, I find him a little reasonable, <laughs> you know? Um, he's kind of like, well, listen, like it wasn't personal and Hera made me do that. And once I started, I couldn't stop. And like, look, look, look what happened. <laughs> um, and then he, and, and, and then he reveals this surprising information 
oh, by the way, um, I the, the Oracle actually told me that I was going to become an enemy hero, that if I die and I'm buried here in this soil and in front of this temple, um, I will be a protective spirit for Athens. Mm. And so suddenly this Athenian nomos that says, oh, we have to, we have to spare um, someone who was taken prisoner on the battlefield. Suddenly that, that's now intention for them um, between what's self-interest and what is ethical. And Alcmena really, uh, really capitalizes on that. Um, and she's, she's trying to figure out a way to get what she wants. Um, earlier, she says, well, what if, um, what if I, what if we just kill him, but I give, I give his body back to his family? Like, wouldn't, would that, would that be okay? <laughs> you know? And that's not the rule, but she's trying to find a loophole. And that's exactly what Kalkaros did in the first scene where he said, you know, you don't have to hand over these suppliants right here. How about you just drop them off at the border and we'll pick them up at the border. And so then it won't be a sovereignty issue. Um, everyone, they're trying to figure out, you know, how can I still get what I want? What's in my own self-interest um, while still like kind of remaining ethical. Um, and I think that's, he, Eurobides is really dramatizing that challenge for us. So in thinking um, about, so back to the, the arc of the play, um, we have sort of this, this balance between sort of ethics, you know, larger ethics, personal interests, exploit from different angles with different characters. Um, do you see there being sort of, sort of a through line with that? Like does Euripides get to a point or is this more of an invitation to consider these tensions? Well, we could talk about what the chorus says as the final lines of the play. Um, Alcmina has this really chilling final call, kill him and then throw him to the dog. And then in, in the Greek text, the chorus says, yes, yes, this seems to me to be a better way. Take him away, servants. And so far as our leaders are concerned, they remain free of pollution. And in the Greek, it's this, it's this kind of weak tauta doke moi, like, oh, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> you know? And they're very easily persuaded. Yeah. Um, and they said, you know, and it's fine because our leaders won't be polluted. Presumably, Alcamina is the one who's going to be polluted by making this decision. So as long as the, the pollution doesn't really fall on our city and it helps us, then it's okay. And so they violate their own knowledge, um, their own customs, their own laws. And so I think we have this tension that then results in a very definite action, yeah. which is that the Athenians violate their own customs. They kill someone they weren't supposed to kill. And, and yet the real betrayal here is that eventually the Spartans will come and attack Athens. Um, the, the biggest betrayal of the story is actually not the Athenian betrayal of their, of their nomos. So, I mean, so is it justifying yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it's inviting us to consider whether this is justified. Yeah. So, I, and I mean, that, that ending is so powerful in that it is so, such a thin pretext, right? Something that seems familiar from modern politics as well. Right. Like to have somebody else do this dirty work. Uh, so then, you know, I mean, one of the questions we talked about that I'd love to hear more from you about is why teach and discuss this play now? So as you probably know, because you work on it, I don't think the hair clad I even makes the top five in the plays people talk about the most with Euripides. Right. But but each time I return to it, I'm like this. This hits hard. Right. Um, so if you have to make a pitch to us, to the world about why this play matters, um, what do you say? Well, it goes along with this decision to take the chorus out because we are the chorus. Um, I mean, especially for those of us who live in America in 2022, um, we are a place where a lot of folks want to come. And I think uh, there are different levels of discourse about immigration policy right now? Are we gonna talk about um, ethics and ideas about who we are versus are we gonna talk about, you know, how much is it going to cost 
to resettle a refugee in the town of Worcester, where I'm currently living. Um, and who's doing that work? And what would it take to make that work humane and efficient and actually realistic? You can talk about shutting down borders, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and so I think this is a play that helps us kind of disambiguate all those different levels of discourse. When are we talking about self-interest? When are we talking about ethics? And what do you do when they, they work together very well sometimes, like with Makaria. Um, she says, hey, this is actually going to be how I show my glory. This is how I'm going to display my birth. You know, it works together with her self-interest. And then what do you do when they're actually in conflict with each other? Yeah. Um, and I think we need to be able to have these conversations with nuance and be able to make distinctions. And this play can help us practice that. I mean, I think you bring up great points because, you know, in our recent discussions about refugees and war, some refugees matter, right? Like, especially if, you know, we're talking about Ukraine and fighting Russians, others get to be um, political props, like Governor DeSantis's stunt in sending um, asylum seekers to Martha's Vineyard, right? Um, and then how fast we sort of uh, responded to that. So I think like you you point out the, the how this play functions as sort of a framework to think through the questions really well. And it's got that Euripidean turn of not giving you any easy moves, right? Like every part through, like he makes you root for both sides or despise both sides. And at the end, um, when you're rooting for the killing of Eurystheus, right? There's something about that that's sobering. Um, so part of what makes, I think, this performance in this context really powerful, uh, the translation by George Theodorides, um, I think, is really fluid. It works really well. We missed out on the chorus. Um, but the actors' readings um, are just, again, um, splendid. So if we can bring the actors in, um, I'll, I'll start us off, Catherine, but anytime you want to talk to them, um, please, please uh, uh, chime in. Um, so I think, so Renee, Tim, Tabitha, um, Gabby, uh, you can show me, show us your faces. Um, and, you know, I, I know that, so Gabby, I'll start with you because we haven't, uh, you know, had you a lot here. Um, so you had this task of coming in at the end, playing a character who has no connection with any, with what the action that's gone on. Um, and then giving this sort of like powerful speech that ends up in shouting for murder. Um, what's that like? So what was going through your head and how do you get yourself in the, in the murderer space? Um, wow, you're just jumping into the big guns. Part of me is like, it's just, you know, a Tuesday night in my house. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's true, but, um, just personalization. And I, there are absolutely moments where I feel like I could kill someone. I mean, I won't, but I think that's the beauty of ancient Greek tragedy is all these primal urges that we experience, um, but have to immediately shut down are allowed to come out and come through us um, in these moments. So I don't know, maybe it's a little uh, like strange to say that I feel like I've, I've, I've had those feelings sometimes multiple times a day with professors, <laughs> with boyfriends, with people. No. <laughs> Um, no, I love that. I know, but I love that you say that. I mean, because Alcmene at that moment really makes me think of Hecuba in the Iliad when she says she yeah. wants to like eat Achilles' liver raw, just like tear into it. And that's something that's visceral, literally, it's visceral, right? But also metaphorically, um, like you get it, right? I think part of the, you know, yeah, not to get Aristotelian here because we don't want to go there, um, but part of the vicarious emotions of this, they're sort of exploring that. And I wonder, like we're, we're in political plays and the political reality we have, we, we've seen people shouting for murder, but really like going along with it and like going into this space of roles. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, we don't have the chorus, but how does your character sort of channel the chorus and power them? Um, and that might not be fair. <laughs> No, but assuming, Paul and I talked a little bit about this, assuming that they are on my side. I mean, I'm old, I'm taking care of children. I feel like I have made my way for myself um, as an immigrant pretty successfully. 
and kind of going back to what you and Catherine were talking about in the beginning, this notion of, you know, self-interest versus communal interest, I think really comes together in Alkmeni who has figured out in from my perspective as Alkmeni, maybe not so much from the academic perspective, but how to serve both herself and the community. Mm. Um, yeah. I don't know if that does that. No, answer? no, that's just, I mean, I, I see Catherine shaking her head. Uh, I was nodding. I, I agree. Like part of what I love about these conversations um, is that you, you all who are inhabiting the characters get us to spaces that I think often academics take several articles or books to get to. Uh, mm. Right. Tabitha, I want to switch to you now. And because you've directed these plays, you've been involved in a lot of them. Um, I'm going to ask you a harder question than usual, right? Um, so you breathe so much life and depth into a character that Catherine and I both see as kind of odd and strange. Um, and in doing so, you I think you radically transform the play in a way by making uh, Macaria um, so sympathetic and real. Um, did you mean to do that? Is this part of like your, your, the way you think about these characters? So something Catherine said earlier was really interesting to me uh, about this character being, you know, so stereotypically noble and all of that. I think Macaria, Macaria has to talk herself up and she talks, I wouldn't say she talks in a circle, but she, she goes through the entire thought process of, I have to do this because it's the right thing because of this place that's taken us in because of also what quality of life would I even have if I didn't do this? Mm -hmm. So as much as it is, it's kind of like, has someone ever like in your life been like, oh my gosh, that was such a great thing for you to do. And you were like, yeah, I just went through with it because I had no choice. I, <laughs> I It was the route that life was going. And so I had to go along with the route of life. Yeah. Um, I think Macaria realizes that like, if she did stick around, there would be nothing for her. And she says this very explicitly. So, I mean, I, as an actor, like, poor thing, because then she says, I give myself with, like, you know, of my own compulsion, and I don't want to draw lots. I want this to be my choice and to make it as much of my choice as, you know, I mean, in my head, to make it as much as my choice as I can, mm -hmm. because the alternative is so sad. Well, and what I love about like that answer and your performances in general is it is it answers for me a problem that that Catherine brought up that I had forgotten about, which is that this line we get in our training that these characters on the stage or in Greek epic don't have interiority, right? And I think yeah, no fake character has interiority; they're not real, right? But they're given it. We imagine it into them in the moment of performance and utterance, right? Um, and so you do that, like you what you did is you you read into the character reality. Um, that that was powerful. So so as usual, thank you. Um, and you know, I'm going to be rethinking Macaria. Um, so uh, so sorry, Renee and Tim. I went with the most interesting people first. Uh, no, but Renee. So again, as always with you, like yeah, I I want you to be in everything that's funny, right? Um, your louse is remarkably unfunny. <laughs> yeah. What does that feel like for you? And how did you sort of see that character? Yeah, I mean. Uh... It's nice that it's so clear, right? I mean, like, save the children. Great, I can do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I put you in a box there and didn't give you much to work with, All right? Um, Tim, you also, so I think Demophon as a character is interesting because he moves, he changes his decision, but you didn't get that, right? You got to have a little of his speech and then Eurystheus um, coming back to this play and these themes after some time. Um, how did you read it this time? Yeah, um, I was, so, so I read, I mean, it's like such a long time ago that we did this, like two years, we, we, we were, yeah, it feels like, it, I don't know whether it feels like two years ago or feels like longer. Time has kind of done weird things in the last since the pandemic um but we i read uh i think i i think i read eolaus when we last did this and taking the role of demophon is interesting this this yeah this this weak leader um very 
uh, we're over here in Britain. We're living. Well, in, I was going to say, chaos. yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> we, you we could be a prime minister, we, Tim. We're, fami- <laughs> we're familiar with weak leadership. Uh, let me put it that way. So suddenly, that was kind of really speaking to me quite strongly. It was like, oh wow, okay, yeah, I, th- this is this is very familiar. Um, so Demophon is kind of in, interesting in in and and seems very sort of relevant, really, and just a, an example of the kind of the chaos that can can come with a, a leader who says one thing and then you know quickly U turns, does another thing, and 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 um, yeah, we didn't see all of that kind of flip flopping around of his tonight because of the cuts, but um, I think. I think actually that is quite an interesting character to play. I mean, he's, he's, um, and then Eurystheus, that's a meaty scene at the end there. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you, you, like you said, I think in your discussion before we read the scene, you, the audience are expecting this cowardly figure, but actually he comes out kind of quite enraged and he's got kind of a lot to, there's, that's, there's, there's a lot to go on there for an actor. Um, yeah, it's, it's good. I like. I mean, I like this play, and I think, I think it is incredibly cu- current and relevant, and um, frighteningly so. Well, the question is: Is Demophon in charge longer than a lettuce? Right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I like your. I like, I like your 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 knowledge of the tabloid, the British tabloid press, Joel. It's how it, it's just it's sublime, um, <laughs> in, in how absurd it is. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, R.I.P. Aristophanes, you would have loved the British tabloids. Um, (laughs) uh, Paul, uh, now that we're turning into living memes, Paul, um, can you talk about the decision to to take out the chorus and and how you sort of envision the play this time as opposed to the last time we looked at it? Yeah. um, I mean, so first of all, I just want to say a big thank you to all the fantastic cast and um, and how totally um, easy it makes it for for me when just kind of go, just get some brilliant people reading and then they they take care of so much of it. So a, a huge thank you to them. And in terms of the um, some of the decisions that I was making with this, um, a lot of that actually was inspired by um, Catherine very kindly sent through her, her thoughts about the about the play and how she teaches it. Um, and then really informed sort of what I was trying to do. So actually then um, sort of really kind of separating out each one of these relatives of Heracles. So we kind of get to see them in their own little kind of frame as it were um, to sort of draw out those different types that that, um, that she um, spoke of. Um, and then really, I suppose in terms of initiating some of the conversations that might come out of um, studying it in that way, um, I wanted to think about how we might make um, the audience, the chorus, for a while actually, and it's, I think it's part of it as well is the fact that you know, this is our 56th episode, I think, and so it's constantly sort of, you know, there's all, there is an element of trying to think, what haven't we tried yet? What should we do? What's, you know, what's, what's a little bit um, different? And for a long time, actually, I've been trying to think about how could we get the audience to actually be the chorus? And I ruled out having like a karaoke <laughs> bouncing ball with text, um, but I almost wanted that. I almost wanted that sense of actually the of of sort of reaching people right down the camera, mm-hmm. and really sort of sort of pinning them with the dilemma. Yeah. And actually, because um, and it's a tricky thing to do because obviously we're reading, so we're kind of constantly sort of obviously like looking at a, at a text, and then I'm asking people, oh, and, and now just look down the down the lens totally, and then you're sort of looking down the lens and just <laughs> going, going like that. Um, so technically it's a tough thing to do, but I think that it's one of the things that we found in this series actually is how close and personal you can be with the audience in this format. And so I felt that that was something that um, then was worth experimenting with this particular um, production to really, yeah, just to try, I suppose, make like an audience chorus and put them on the spot um, at certain, at just certain key moments. I, I'm trying to imagine some sort of like live from location shots if we actually get like an audience chorus someday. Um, I don't know how to make that work. Um, so um, before we wrap up today, Paul, I know you have some announcements and can tell us about what else we're doing this fall with Reading Greek Tragedy Online. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, uh, so this is um, episode one 
of season five of Reading Group Tragedy Online. And uh, we have four more episodes coming up in this season. Um, so um, on Wednesday, the 2nd of November, we'll be performing Odysseus, which is a verse tragedy by Nikos Kazantzakis. Um, on Friday, the 18th of November, uh, we'll be performing Iphigenia, and this is a new version of Iphigenia, um, uh, which has been developed by a colleague of Catherine's uh, from Holy Cross. So there's a, there's a Holy Cross theme running through this. Um, so that's Mary Ebert, who has combined the two Iphigenia plays together. Um, and they're, they're actually opening, I believe, their, um, their new performing arts centre with that as a production there. And we'll be then um, reading it um, on Friday the 18th. And then on Wednesday the 30th of November, we'll be returning to Agamemnon. Um, and on Wednesday the 14th of December, we will end this season with Amphitryo um, in a translation by Toff Marshall. Um, and really what I've tried to do with the programming of this is that um, we're ending sort of, we're sort of, we're sort of bookending the, the season with a little bit of a Heracles type theme. Um, with the Children of Heracles and Amphitryo. And then working our way in, we've got two different types of homecoming. We've got Odysseus and Agamemnon. And then we've also got, even got a little pairing just in the one episode in the middle with the two of Janias, um, as well. So that's what we've got coming up, all at 3 p.m. Eastern time and 8 p.m. UK time. Um, and we'll be, I'm, I'm hoping that all these, and the deadline for that is the 31st of January. And again, there is a link that will appear um, hopefully in the live chat and it's all on the Out of Chaos website. We've also recently over the summer completed the um, Playing Oedipus competition in Italy. We had a whole load of students who submitted absolutely amazing videos um, and so that's sort of another initiative. And when we, would, when we did Play Medea, which was our first student competition um, a couple of years ago, Gabby in fact was one of our prize winners um, on that. Um, and, and as a, in total, in Playing Day, we had over 852 students being involved across all the different countries that we, that we ran that in. Um, we're also going to be doing some online episodes in the spring and some in-person episodes in the spring as well. We're hoping to do a mini Reading Greek Tragedy online tour. Obviously, we'll have to think about the online bit of the title there. Um, <laughs> and um, we're, that is supported by... Um, the, the CHS, um, so huge thanks to them. And we're also then looking for other partners. So if there are anyone watching um, at an institution who would be interested in having a workshop, a talk, a reading, then please do drop us a line. And then the final thing I will say is that um, the British American Drama Academy, um, many of whose alumni and teachers have been part of this series, including once again, Gabby um, as an alumni um, twice over, um, of, uh, of BARDA. The, the BARDA Greek theatre programme is reopening applications. So we ran the very first version of that this past June and students spent four weeks um, in London and then travelling through Greece and then in Oxford as well, studying and performing in equal measure. Um, and it was an amazing experience for, for me and hopefully for the 17 students who are part of that as well. Um, and again, there's a, a link um, hopefully appearing in the live chat where you can find out more information about that. Thank you. Paul, you said five minutes and you got it almost perfectly. It's almost oh, as if you're a professional. Um, so, <laughs> so you know, the I know that list was pretty impressive, but, you know, when you can actually rewind and listen again. Um, but if you, the next opportunity to see us in action will be November 2nd. We'll be uh, doing a very interesting play about Odysseus. I won't spoil it at all. Um, until then, um, I want everyone to stay happy and healthy um, as much as possible. Outlast the lettuce if you're in the UK. Um, and before I close today, I want to thank you, Catherine, for joining us today and teaching us so much. I look forward um, to having you at Brandeis in the fall. So thank you. Thank you to our actors, Gabby, Tim, um, Renee, Tabitha, um, the interns and, and helpers who've been behind the scenes making this work, Danielle and Olivia, our crew um, headed by Ali Marbury, who makes all of this possible every week, the Cosmos Society crew, Ellen, Janet, Sarah, and Keith, who keep 
keep us going. The poster design that comes from John Coley and Ali who makes it work. Um, and everyone who joins us for the chat when we show up um, uh, every other week or so during the season. Um, so until November 2nd, um, be safe, uh, be well, um, and read some more Euripides um, to think about your life and your choices. <laughs>